So it's, uh, it's my great pleasure uh, to chair the session on, on IMF reform and to introduce uh, my colleague and friend, Jose De Gregorio. Uh, Jose is currently the, the Dean of the School of Economics and Business at the University of Chile, and he's a, he's a senior fellow here. Uh, he has many claims to fame. I think the main one is that he has a PhD from MIT, but he has done a few things since then. Uh, he was uh, uh, Minister of the Economy, he was Governor of the Central Bank of uh, Chile, uh, and he has a very large number of uh, uh, very important academic publications. Uh, so it is a, a, a great pleasure to, uh, to have him. Uh, as the uh, introductory notice mentioned, uh, he and he, three of his friends, uh, Taka Ito, Charles Viplos, and Barry Eichengreen, uh, wrote the first uh, Geneva report, and it was on the uh, uh, IMF and the IMF reform. And it's interesting to compare the two. I may do some of this uh, after he has talked. Uh, this is the second attempt uh, to make the IMF a better place. So the, I think the structure of the, of the event is that he talks for about 20 minutes, Jose. Then I make a few remarks, and then we go Q&A. Good. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be here at the, at the Peterson and being introduced by Olivier. He said everything, almost everything. Uh, uh, he forgot to say that I was his student. So I took like four courses with him. So many of my problems may be due to my education. So I don't know. It's, uh, but thanks, Olivier. We, we wrote with uh, these friends and with Barry, Tak and Charles 20 years ago uh, uh, we wrote this first Geneva report and we proposed and we discussed and the idea of an independent and accountable IMF. That was it. This was the time just after the Asian crisis. So there was a lot of discussion on the policy approach to, to crisis. There was also the beginning of the, of the regional funds and, and regional cooperation. A lot of this was because of the, of the uh, 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 problems in Asia with the, with the fund involvement during the Asian crisis. Now, 20 years ago, we revisit the issues and, and, and we wrote this report. And the report is on the page of the, of the institute of this event. It's not still the, the copies. And, and we, we revisit many of the issues on these 20 years. The only thing that we are almost sure is that there won't be another report 20 more years. So I think this is, uh, but, but for the rest, uh, the, the, what we do in, the, in this report is to, to talk how the world has changed, how the IMF has changed, and then we go to some issues that are quite important, the emergence of, of regional funds, swap lines, I will comment on that. Uh, and China, which I think that is the most important thing that has happened to the world economy in the last 20 years, and IMF governance. Now, uh, in terms of the talk, I will change a little bit because otherwise it could be too long and, and tedious to go all, all the details and to summarize as, some aspects of the book. So I'll take simultaneously how the IMF and the, and, the, and, the, and the world have changed. Then I'll talk a bit about other issues with the IMF and more institutional, a couple of comments. And then some new challenges, regional funds and, and swap arrangements, the rise of China. And then the traditional issues, which are for long time precautionary lines, IMF resources, and, and a few words on, on IMF governance. That was at the end what we we end up in in the previous report. So regarding regarding capital flows, this is just I, I wrote those those boxes to say what we saw was an increase in 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 capital flows, and this also is related to the view that crisis and turmoil in emerging markets comes a lot from capital account movements. We saw. An increase in FDI has declined after the crisis. Portfolio debt has increased uh, uh, very significantly, while other debt has come down. And this is a portfolio shift that we have observed and discussed over the years from uh, uh, debt, from, from bank debt to uh, uh, capital markets. And, and this, I think, that is a, 
volatility, a lot of capital inflows. This is kind of the, the, the first piece of evidence. Now, if you look at sudden stops, which is a typical concern among emerging markets, what we see is that the number has remained relatively stable, except for the crisis, and, and they tend to be simultaneous. There is a lot of simultaneity in the, in the, in the sudden stops, so what we have is a, this could be contagion or could be common shocks. This was the case during the, the, the global financial crisis, so this is kind of an important, uh, also the uh, 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 concern regarding safeguard and, and the role of the IMF, of course. So it's a, this is a, the number, at the left you have the number of IMF programs, roughly, they remain the same, stable, there's no big changes. At the right hand side is the, is the, the amount committed under IMF program. What we see, I tell you about this, what we see here is that it, the amount committed has increased. Now, most of the increase, and if you dig, most of the increase has been due to precautionary lines. It's the yellow line. I don't know if you can see it, but I, I, I saw it. It's the precautionary lines. Precautionary lines which are committed, they haven't been withdrawn. So there is a lot of commitment. And most of this commitment, then when I, I we look at the data, is Mexico. Mexico has sort of 80 billion committed and it's like seven times their quota. It has no, no access limit, the precautionary lines. So it's a, this is the, this, the, the evidence. But this also leads to the issue about precautionary lines, IMF resources, and what to do if there is a need to support many countries at the same time. So I, I, I will come back to this. The other thing that was kind of the discussion in the late 90s, that the world should go to this bipolar bionic chain rates, fully flexible or peg. We haven't seen many changes. We haven't seen many changes. Basically, I, I took here Latin America and Southeast, Asia and, and Southeast Asia. We see that most countries are intermediate today and, and they move to intermediate. They are much less peg and, and freely, freely floating. All countries intervene from time to time. This, if you go granular, if you go granular, and we discussed some of this, if you go granular and, and to the details, there has been a tendency towards more flexibility among these countries because they have moved from a chain rate bands and crawling pegs to manage flow. So this I would say, it's a very, uh, data and, and classification of countries are kind of arbitrary and it's, so I, I wouldn't say, but this is what we mostly see among emerging markets, is some movement toward flexibility, but with a lot of intervention. So the bipolar view hasn't come. Uh, that, that at some point was so also even this bipolar view supported by the by the fund. And the other thing is uh, inflation. Here is a, I think that is a big success. I, I, there is no causality in the graph. Many countries following now inflation targets, increased number. Since the 90s, and since we wrote the previous report that was about 10 countries, now depending how you classify, there may be between 30 and 40 countries following inflation targets. And among emerging markets, what we see is that there was a sharp decline in the late 90s in inflation. The inflation consolidation and the low inflation consolidation came in the late 90s. And in the late 90s, an adoption was closer to the 2000s. So, I would say that causality goes two ways. And most countries that I know the details is that they adopted inflation target once inflation was low. It was a way to lock low inflation rather than to bring low inflation. I think that this is, this is important also in terms of designing this inflation. Uh, uh, inflation target is what has helped countries to run contracyclical monetary policy to have low inflation, but after inflation decline, which coincided. This was a, this was a global phenomenon. It's, it's interesting. I, I had just recently a discussion on Israeli disinflation. They say, well, we were extremely successful. But they cut inflation in the early 80s from 400 to 20. But inflation came below five in 1997 or 98. 
it's, it's quite interesting, but this is something that is beyond the, the report, but it's, it's, I think that's quite important, and, and for central banks, so one has always the advice to look at what's going on here with inflation. Regarding the other big issue at the IMF at, at the right is what's going on with financial integration. Financial integration has increased, has increased in measuring asset plus liabilities uh, over GDP, has increased, but most of the increase has been within advanced economies. So financial integration has, uh, 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 it had it since the late 90s, it had a sharp increase in advanced economies. When you see there was also some increase in financial integration in middle-income countries and low-income countries. This is just dividing the world in three pieces of the same number of countries. And then if you see at capital account restrictions, as you go down, there is a financial opening, and as you go up, there is a, some closeness. This is, a, this is for the high income, but the high income, you see that it's moving between 0 0.16 and 0 0.24, it's, it's not big changes. And the same for emerging markets and low income, some closeness, but quite small. So I wouldn't also say that there has been huge changes, okay? What is interesting is that despite the small changes in the index of capital account restrictions, there has been a lot of increase in financial integration, which I think that from a policy point of view, one has to learn to live with more capital flows, whether it likes them or it doesn't like them. The other important thing and, and development in the, in the, and this is also related to the, to the view of the IMF that countries should, should have capital account liberalization. I don't want to run out of time, this is a lot of reserve accumulation for precautionary reasons and also for some mercantilism, especially when you see that part of that, it, it, in, if you leave aside uh, uh, China, there was a large fraction of increase in reserve by commodity exporting countries, and most of this was in order to fight currency appreciation during the commodity price boom. So this is... Uh, well, this is the other way around. This, let me just close. There has been a lot of improvements. I, I, I didn't talk here in detail, but there is improvement in bilateral, multilateral surveillance, spillovers report. I think that has been a, a big advance at the fund. Transparency is a big step forward at the fund. We have a lot of data. Most of data from the reports are fully available and transparency in Article 4 and, and, and most of work. I think this is a bias, a personal bias. I think that there needs to be more, more transparency in research. Uh, those that have written papers for the Peterson know that's very tough to do everything in order to be the, uh, all your empirics replicated, and, and it's a lot of work. You have to clean up data, codes, and everything, and fight with your arrays. Uh, but despite the cost, I think that's extremely helpful. I think it's, to, to have a, and to be fully transparent with research data. In the policy recommendation, the fund has become, I would say, in summary, more eclectic. In one size does not fit all, and so the need for financial uh, opening or, or controls. There are still some loose ends, and this is something that, at least to me, and I convince my, my colleagues, uh, has bothered me. It's all this idea that, that we support exchange rate management in some cases through reserve accumulation or capital controls, but that could be, a, 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 could be defined as currency manipulation, how we dissociate or how we think about currency manipulation and letting the chain rate adjustment to work around the world, but at the same time to allow for capital controls or, a, or, or reserve accumulation that most of the time have a reason regarding exchange rates rather than or other things. So this is, I think, that the loose end. But uh, new challenges, as I said, and I will talk regional funds and swaps, China, and then precautionary lines and governance. I go there. Yeah. So regarding regional funds, they are they have a lot of regional funds. These are three of the classic: the Fly Latin America, the Chiang Mai Initiative, multilateral. It's very difficult to learn all of this acronym. But it's uh, uh, in in Asia the ESM, former EFM in Europe, and, and many others. So 
They are different size. The FRAR is small in Latin America. They provide some support. They have provided some bridge loans and have helped in some with even regarding IMF, IMF programs. Not a big deal. Uh, Chama is much more important, of course, ESM. There is a, there is a political issue and, and, and stigma that have given the incentives for the formation of regional funds. However, there are still political problems and political tension within regions, so you won't solve this with, uh, with, with reserve funds. But reserve funds, the rationale is that you can put reserves and then you may need less uh, uh, demand for, for, for accumulating reserves and self-insurance. And at the same time, they may complement a, a fund programs, okay? It depends on the size of the regional fund, uh, whether they can help or no. And I think that the, 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 issue is, uh, the issue about the accumulating reserves is that when you face common shocks, all they have, they, uh, they are, most of them are regional shocks. So it's very difficult that you will have a lot of diversification if you do, a, a, if you try to pull reserve within your region. The worst and the most complicated problem with regional funds is first the IMF position, which it seems very sensible is to say there is equal treatment to regional funds, and there must be a lead agency, the IMF, which is kind of global in IMF programs. The big problem, I think, is what are the conditions to join forces? And we discuss a lot who, who should be on the table and who should be part of the, is the regional fund or the central bank? This was a big problem in Europe. And, and how to solve this agreement? We thought a lot about how to do arbitration. We didn't come with any interesting idea, so we drop it. But this, uh, and this is uh, much more related to the Troika. Should the central bank, the European central bank, be negotiating or which side of the table? And if we have this agreement, who takes the, the lead? And I think that those are problems that have not been solved and, and, and that are quite important. Second, regarding swap lines, and, and this is interesting because swap lines are a great idea, and this, they become very famous in the crisis. The Fed extended 13 bilateral swap lines during the crisis. I will make also a disclosure about the, this. And, and so many a, a, a advanced economies established swap lines. Now it follows the PBOC, the, the Bank of China, they have 36 swap lines currently, and it's, a, it's a quite important. I think that it's a, it's a very good idea. What's the problem with the swap lines? The swap lines, the problem is that they don't solve global problems. Why? Because there is no a transparent and clear mechanism to provide swap lines. Uh, the rationale for a, for a central bank, for the Fed to provide the swap line is because they need to support the country that may threaten their financial stability. So when Chile calls them and tells them, could we have a swap line in the middle of the crisis because it was very cool to have a swap line, they say, well, you are too small. And, and then you say, well, you are right. How you can argue that Chile is relevant to receive a swap line from the US? So it's sort of arbitrary. It's, it's, it, it breaks multilateralism. So the idea, although swap lines support a lot and Hopefully, many countries have swapped with the, with the major central banks. It's not a, a part of the, of the infrastructure that we can think multilateral to deal with crisis. And the, the other thing is that many times, crises are not global. They are regional. So it's also very difficult to think that you could establish swap lines in order for central bank of reserve currency countries to go and support a, a small open economies that have problems. So it's, it's, it's a quite... A, it's a good idea, I think that it will continue. Just as an anecdote, also one of the countries that have swap lines with, the, with, with, the, with China is Argentina. Of course, it hasn't been withdrawn. It's, it's not a big issue because, well, in the case of China, uh, the renminbi is not a, a main international currency, an issue that I will talk now. China, this is one of the most important developments, and I will, I will focus there because I'm five minutes there. I will be running out of time. China has made many changes. It poses a lot of challenges, geopolitical, geoeconomical, it's, it's huge. China was almost 3% at the beginning of the 90s, 
and growing at 9%, now it's close to 15%. And if you, if you forecast China growing at about 5%, the US close to two, you will have that 2028, China will be the largest economy in the world. And, and of course, when you are the largest, you, want, you also want to have some influence in, in the world economy. So there is one detail, but that I think that is important and to show what, what, what will come, is that according to the Articles of Agreement, the IMF headquarters should be on the, on, the, on the largest country, on the countries with the largest share, and China should have the largest share, so perhaps all IMF staff, sorry, will have to move to Shanghai or to, or to Beijing. And this is, it will happen, it's, I don't know, but it will be, a, 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 it, this shows the, the, the size of the challenge that is, is ahead. And the, then there is a China, what would be China, the role in, in, in picking management, in also choosing the, and, and the main policy advice, or the, which I think that there may be less discussion, but there are issues in which uh, there may be some disagreement and it's not clear. We have a, then there is a, the connection with the, with the World Bank and lending, the Belt and Road Initiative, the Asian Investment and Infrastructure Bank, and what are the implications, the relations with the World Bank, the multilateralization. There are many, many issues. So what I think that is, uh, will become quite important. All that one can suspect is that in the future, when, the, when this comes, that will, it will take 10 years to adjust the, the quotas. So, but at some point, China may be and, and likely to be le, the largest uh, shareholder at the, at the, at the fund. And, and that, of course, will have a lot of important implications. Precautionary, yes, a couple of words. Precautionary lines and fast qualification lines. This was the great idea in the late 90s. We predicted that they wouldn't work. They, they, will not, they, they would not work, and they didn't work. Uh, there are three countries. Uh, one quit, so they, so there was a Colombia, Mexico, and Poland. And Poland early this year withdrew from the qualification. The big problem of the, of the, of the precautionary lines is that was designed for countries that do not need the, the, this precautionary line, and the countries that would need it do not qualify. So there is some impossibility in the, in the precautionary lines. It has been flexibilized, and moreover, I think that a problem in recent documents at the IMF is the proposal that countries, we don't know when to apply. Whenever you apply, there is a stigma, there is the idea, why are you applying? And then, but there is now the proposal that countries should exit. At some point, they graduate. So at the end, say, if you are there and you have to graduate, is that you have not strong fundamentals. You have quasi strong fundamentals, and you have strong fundamentals the day that you do not need the precautionary line. So it's kind of in inconsistent, this discussion. And, and, and we had a lot of discussion. This also has the problem is if 10 countries like Mexico go for, a, for, the, for, the, for the precautionary lines, there won't be IMF resources. There will be more. The IMF has 1.4 trillion, and there is a piece by, by Ted, very good with showing how this will, a quarter of that, or more than a quarter of that, will disappear after some bilateral lending ends in, in a couple of years. Then there is the issue about the NAV. So there is a lot of problem with resources. We came with a very simple idea and we said, what the IMF should do, it should be able to approve four countries with strong fundamentals and that may be affected by contagion and some global turmoil to have a fast qualification facility. I don't know the time, but they could solve in a way. If already there is a deep work in the, in the Article 4, if the Article 4 shouldn't say this country qualify, no, this is not, nobody would accept that from the countryside. So, but at least they could say this economy is strong and that could help to do a very fast approval. There is a rapid finance, rapid financing initiative, RFI at the fund, but this is for very small countries with very limited access in case of, 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 of earthquake and commodity price collapses. And so it's for, for, for big uh, traumatic events. It's not, it's not for macroeconomic adjustment. So let me just close in two minutes, I'm perfect. I'm very good student. <laughs> so it's governance. 
in the first report, we said, well, what, what, what we can propose? And, and we said, well, if we support central bank independence all around the world, what we're saying is that let's be an independence and accountability. We said, let's make all the policy making independent with a very clear mandate. What we cannot use that at the fund. And there are two main reasons for this, which I think that in very, they also uh, are, are relevant for the fund. First, there are time inconsistency problems. And when you arrive in a country, you have to increase access, you have to join forces with other countries, and we are always creating new ways uh, in order to increase access because crises have become more, uh, 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 more uh, uh, bigger, and so we need more support. This is what's, uh, uh, so there is a time consistency policy. And then there is also the political capture and political interference, because there is a lot of at stake in, in many cases. And, and so this is the same, sort of the same reasons that we used to support central bank independence. So we said, well, we could just do the same. And, and the idea, most of the problem that we mentioned before, you know, regardless of where the IMF headquarters are, but the influence and all the political tensions that may arise in this bipolar world and tensions with RFIs, with quotas, could be solved, creating an, an, an independent management board, a accountable to a non-resident IMF board. And this non-resident IMF board would be composed by high-level policymakers, how is now the interim committee, and by with a with a with a resident with a with a independent management and with an independent board. Seven people we haven't go into the details. And that they they are not representative of countries. They are representative of their they of, of the whole constituency. And I think that that, that could be, it's a for, this is quite unlikely to happen, <laughs> to be very honest. <laughs> it didn't happen 20 years, there is no reason. But we think that at least in order to discuss and to give a rationale to what should be a good governance for the fund, it makes, it's quite consistency, it's quite consistent with what we have been thinking over the years about the IMF. Just one final point, there are things that we didn't discuss, and, and, and just by checking, and it's a, it's a, I think that they are, the, the, the other issue is quite important, it's a bit separate from IMF governance, so that's why we didn't discuss it, but it has been discussed here, and in some other places, it's the creation of safe assets, and Rune Meyer, Settle Meyer, and some other Mayer may, may have been working on this for the Eurozone, Calvo in Latin America, and I think that that's also a good issue to keep thinking about the uh, uh, stability of the global economy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jose. Um, let me start with uh, compliments, which are not pro forma. Uh, Facts of which you gave uh, some some sample. It's it's How the is same. <laughs> well, I think this this is working. Can we switch? Maybe if I put it out. No, but this this.
these ones. Matt. Testing one, two. Good. Get your voice. Works for him, should work for me. Good. So again, it, it, uh, it's very much uh, worth, worth, worth reading. Uh, it's interesting to compare the, the two reports, and there's a, a sense of continuity, which is good news, <laughs> even it's the same set of authors. Uh, there, are, there are basically two main themes. Uh, the first one is, and you already had it, is the importance of capital flows, of the capital account in the crisis. Uh, uh, which you already kind of emphasized in the first report and has turned out to be indeed extremely important. I think that, that emphasis is, is completely right. Then the other one is on governance. And I'm more skeptical that you keep pushing. And uh, maybe you're right, maybe you're not. Uh, the, the differences in the two reports are also interesting. The first one had a lot on uh, debt restructuring. And this one has very little on it. Uh, I think that partly because the fund actually has thought about it quite a bit, has introduced new ways of dealing with it. So we've made progress. That might be the reason you decided not to emphasize it. And then the, so this is the element which disappeared from the, you know, from what's in the old report is no longer there. And the new element is China. And I must say at the end, I'm a bit, not confused, but lost as to exactly what this implies for the fund, except going to Beijing. Uh, which indeed would be traumatic. Uh, so let me let me make a, a few remarks of my own, given that I've seen the, the beast from from inside. I think indeed the the main issue, if I had to choose one, is the fact that the crisis now comes from the capital account, and uh, they are triggered by information about the current account, but they really happen in the capital account, and the countries have very large gross positions. I think one of the mistakes which we used to make was to look at net positions, but when investors are unhappy, it's the gross position which matters, it's the gross liabilities. And uh, the size of these liabilities is such that this creates enormous challenges for the fund or for any institution which is in charge of helping uh, attenuate the effects of a crisis. There, there is an interesting comparison to the position of central banks national central banks when they are faced with uh, uh, a liquidity run or a bank run, which is that what they can do, they can basically apply budgets, principles, and then freely against good collateral, uh, or in the words of Mario Draghi, they can do whatever it takes. Uh, and But that's an option that central banks have. There is no such thing as good collateral in the same way for a country. And so the IMF is really in a different position when it needs to advance liquidity to a country as opposed to a central bank advancing liquidity to a bank. And I, I think that's at the source of many of the most difficult issues uh, that, that, the bank, that the fund is, is, is facing. So let me, <coughs> in that light, take two of the issues that you uh, focused on. The first one is IMF and swap lines. And I think swap lines uh, have a, a flexibility, a, a speed of execution, which is such that it cannot, that cannot be done uh, by, by, by the fund. Uh, and the fund programs which have tried to do something like swap lines, as you say, precautionary uh, programs, have not worked, and I think it's for good reasons, uh, is that uh, even if a country you know, is pre-approved, the fear of losing the pre-approval next time is big. So it, it is not as good as reserves, it's not as good as swap lines. Uh, so I don't think the proposal that you briefly discussed, but which is playing a bigger role in, in the report, of the, uh, how is it called, fast qualification facility, uh, solves the problem either. Uh, it has too much uncertainty, ex ante, uh, to really work. So in the end, I think the right system is a combination of swap lines and the fund. My sense is the, uh, the central banks can come in nearly overnight, which the fund cannot do. They can provide liquidity in a fairly flexible way. But if a problem goes on for two weeks, two months, then it, it, it is an indication that there is another issue, probably a, a risk of insolvency somewhere. And then I think the fund has to come in 
uh, and do a standby or do a regular program, but basically there has to be a shift from the swap lines uh, to, 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 to fund funding, uh, fund funding uh, which I, I think it can be done, and we thought about it when I was there, and I think it can be done. On IMF and regional agreements, I mean, it seems to me that's, that's a development for the best. And regional agreements, you know, no better that the part of the world they are in. Uh, they have more friendly relations with each other. They can do things that the fund cannot do. At the same time, the IMF has more expertise. It can play bad guy, bad cop much more easily than any of the members. Uh, so I think again here, uh, there is a way of articulating the two, which is not a problem. And we just have to find a way to do it. But I think that's a very useful uh, de development. Uh, the last remark is on governance. So you didn't mention it, but a lot of the papers about Greece and the role that Europe may have played in making the Greek program less than optimal. My sense is it had nothing to do with governance at the fund. It had to do with the ECB, the bargaining power of the ECB, and the positions of the ECB on debt restructuring, which basically the fund had to accept. That's where the problem was. It was in Frankfurt. It was not at the executive board upstairs. Uh, changing the resident to a non-resident board would not make much difference. The fund is not a central bank. It is basically an institution in which the members are powerful. It cannot be as independent as a central bank. There are probably arrangements to be made, but I have a sense that that's not the most productive uh, set of reforms to, to think about. So some remarks on, on the report. Again, thank you for forcing me to think about these things. And maybe you answer briefly, and then we open to the floor. Yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, there are a couple of things that are quite interesting. I think that quite interesting, your point about this, this restructuring that we haven't been talking, and, and that now is much more uh, because to some extent it has been solved. Perhaps we, we should have a, been more clear in some points of what it's, how the world had changed, but what things we do not have to worry now. And, and that has been also part of the, of the fund progress. Now, the, the two points I think that this um, could be more controversial. Swap lines are great. So let's be very clear. So, oh, the, the world could be organized around swap lines. And, and would be the end of the problem. The problem is who to extend the swap line and when to extend the swap line. So I just imagine sitting at the Fed, approving a swap line to Korea that had a swap line. So where we can, where we can activate that swap line? We cannot activate that swap line when there is a problem within Korea, Malaysia, and Indonesia because the mandate of the of the Fed is, with, is regarding financial stability in the US. So perhaps that's not a big of a problem to argue in Congress that we're extending swap lines because, let's go even deeper, because Chile, Peru, and Colombia have some financial turmoil. So there is a, there is a big problem. Then, so, so this is when to activate the swap. And, and the second is who should be, should have a swap line. So again, Chile won't have a swap line with the U.S. because they cannot tell Congress that they have a swap line because if Chile enters in turmoil, it may threaten financial stability in the U.S. And I, I would like, but, but it's not possible. So it's, a, so it's very difficult to build around swap lines, the, 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 the multilateral uh, 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 safeguard of, of financial stability. So I think that, that, that that's a big problem. Now, the, the substitute and what we suggest, so whether there are swap lines and you can activate is fine. They said, a, a Jeremy and Beatrice and Ted Truman, they have talked about, for example, whether the IMF or countries with FCL could have a swap line. So the big, big problem is that at the end, the one that decides is the board of the central bank of the reserve currency country. And, and, and if they cannot argue that this affects the domestic economy, it's very difficult to, to do something. 
Now, what we say about the fast qualification line and what we have in mind, it's kind of very simple to say, instead of pre-qualification, what you do is you go, if you go to the fund, you ask them for funding, and if you don't qualify because you are a weak economy, you still can have a standby arrangement. So I think that this is kind of, a, and, and it's kind of what happened in Argentina. Argentina announced, if you look at the first Macri speech, the first Macri speech said, we will go to the fund to ask for a for precautionary line, he said something like that. And well, those that knows about this and we're working about this, they, they don't qualify. So they went there and took them a month, or even more than a month to have a standby arrangement. So I, I do, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that this goes in the stages. And especially, uh, Argentina is a big problem. It's, it's not just a, it's, it's not a multiple equilibrium or contagion. They have fundamental problems. So I think that this, the fast qualification facilities is a, it's a way just to do what the fund would like to do with countries that have strong fundamentals, but without the pre-approval and the stigma. Still, there are problems with IMF resources. If many countries will come at the same time, still, I say, and, and this is related to what you say, and, and right, is that the, the central banks are lending for last resort. They can issue liquidity. They, they can uh, uh, use good collateral for that, and that's not an option for the IMF. And, and we discussed something about funding. It's very difficult. Now, uh, let me, about the, the, whether Greece, whether Greece and the Greece problem was a problem with the IMF or with the, I, I'm from outside, from the ECB, without being much involved in the, in the, in the European crisis even intellectually, so just as a, as an observer. Whether it was a problem with the, with the European Central Bank or with the IMF, well, it was both. It was because the European Central Bank and the Europeans decided and the IMF had to follow. It's very difficult to follow an institution on which you have a lot of political influence in the margin, I'm not saying on a, on a permanent basis, but if you have problems, with the directors and with your representative of the fund. And, and in the politics, they join what right for the fund, you can have a lot of influence. And I think that that's what could be achieved with a, with a, with a more independent board in which it is credible that you won't act on this influence. So, so I think that this is what we do with Central Bank. So they say, well, cut the rate. And they say, okay, yeah, I will try, but we have an independent board. And they say, sorry. And it's, uh, it's, uh, I think that helps. I, I don't know what would have been the, the end result. Unfortunately, in this kind of reports, you cannot run regressions or do a contrafactual or an, even a model because it's a, we don't know what would have happened, but I think that could be a good arrangement. And for this also, we don't think that this should happen from one day to the other, but, but we can make some programs of, at least in terms of the rules of engagement being a bit more clear. And, and they changed with the Mexican crisis that we discussed in the previous report. They changed again with the, with, the, with, the crisis, with the Greek crisis. And so perhaps what we need is more the set of rules and the, 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 the fund will get involved in this crisis. Um. Brief rejoinder, but I want to uh, leave time for questions. The, uh, on Greece, that's a long debate. But one, again, when one thinks about the counterfactual, I suppose there was a non-resident board, and management was formally a bit more independent. I'm not sure that would have been very different, but that's to be discussed. On, on the swap lines, I mean, you're completely right that the swap lines in the end are going to be given to some countries uh, not necessarily the countries which are crucial to U.S. financial stability, but the friends of the U.S. So I think we have to accept that uh, and accept the fact that swap lines are not going to be given to all the countries which need it when they need it, unless there was a change in the mandate of the central banks saying you're in charge of global financial stability, but it's not going to come anytime soon. Now, I, I accept that restriction. Given that, I still think that taking the number of swap lines available is given there is basically some way of organizing things so that the fund comes in in some way. 
to, uh, uh, to, to work with the swap lines. And I agree with you that I, th I had not thought about this, but you can think of the FQL as basically second best solution to the lack of swap lines for some countries, right? The countries which are not friends with the US or with China uh, will at least have the option of going to the FQL, which is not very different, which is not quite as good as a swap line, but may actually do the trick for some of them. So in that light, I think that uh, that proposal makes, makes sense. I assume you don't want to do a for, for <laughs> further <laughs> rejoinder. So uh, floor is open. You, uh, you can use the mic and you can introduce yourself. Charles Collins. Thanks, Olivier. I just managed to slip in front of Ted here. <laughs> uh, Charles Collins, uh, I work at the Independent Evaluation Office in the IMF. Uh, we also did a, uh, a study 10 years ago on IMF governance, and we've just done an update of it. Uh, it's now public. It's available on our website if you're interested. Uh, it's quite different uh, from the Geneva report. Uh, it takes a ground eye view uh, rather than a 10,000 feet view. Uh, it really gets into the into the weeds. So if you if you're interested in, in in the details of how the executive board works, how management is chosen, uh, how the fund interacts with the G20, that's a, a good place to go. Uh, Olivier said it right before I uh, we started that I could give a, a very short indication of 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 what the report concludes. And I'll just give it a two-sentence version, and then uh, raise a, a question for, for Jose. The two sentences are that, one, that, that actually quite a lot has changed in IMF governance over the past 10 years, uh, most notably the, the quota and voice reforms in 2008, 2010, uh, but also a number of uh, reforms of, of executive board procedures, management selection, uh, accountability procedures. Uh, However, uh, despite this real progress, uh, the, the fundamental judgment that was made 10 years ago remains the same, that the fund is an institution that is much better in terms of effectiveness and efficiency. It, it delivers what its members want. Uh, it responds quickly to crises. However, uh, there remain some pretty deep concerns about representation and accountability. Uh, that have not yet been uh, fully solved. Progress has been made, but these issues have not been solved. And here's where I come to the connection with the Geneva report and a question for Jose. Is it, in our view, representative, this representation is really important at the fund. Um, if you don't have a perception that the fund is a representative institution uh, responding to the voice of all the shareholders, over time, the fund will lose its legitimacy, and over time, it'll lose its effectiveness. Uh, I think the fund is already much less effective, say, in Asia, uh, with the Asia crisis leaves, has left a, a lingering stigma than, than, than elsewhere. And the question for, for Jose is, is, I, is uh, I'd be interested to hear your, your view on how the reforms that you suggest could affect representation. If representation is important, uh, I would have a concern that actually moving to a non-resident board and a more powerful management actually goes in the wrong direction uh, because it reduces the capacity of a resident executive board to actually play uh, a quite an important role in the decision-making process and, and, to, and to feel that they're playing an important role in the decision-making process. I think if you have a more uh, independent management, independent board, then the decision-making will tend to be dominated more by the very large shareholders uh, with less role uh, for the uh, smaller, uh, more numerous shareholders, but important members of the fund and important clients of the fund when it, when it comes to crisis prevention and crisis resolution. Thanks. Yeah, it's a, it's a very good point. It's, um, in order for the institutions to be strong and, and, and to have traction, you need representation and legitimacy. And that, that's uh, representation and legitimacy from the part of the contributors, the countries, and also for countries that are involved in programs. That's, that's a very good point. Now, so then you, you ask, and at least I have to say that, I don't know, 
but it's, a, it's what's happened with legitimacy and representation when you have, I will extreme, but a bunch of technocrats deciding who knows where uh, about who country to grant or no a, a, a program and the conditions of the program. It's, a, it's difficult because in the current in the current form, you can say there is a lot of legitimacy for some, but not for others. And this was the tensions in the Asian crisis, then in Europe. So, so it's kind of, there is a larger variance in terms of legitimacy across countries. Perhaps now legitimacy could be smaller, on average, I don't know, but, but, but less diverse. And, and then I thought, while you were talking, what's happened with central banks is the same. They're not legitimate in, in the sense that the representation and the political representation is much less than what they had when they were not independent. But all in all, my view is that they are kind of the most prestigious, boring institutions in countries. So I'm not sure, so sure, but it's a, it's a very serious uh, issue that what you, what you want is not just a bunch of technology cards running a, 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 a financial stability around the world, but it's a, is a, is you need a, a lot of legitimacy and representation. And, can't, and it's quite important for large shareholders to feel represented. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's power delegation. It's not giving up power. I don't know. This is a politically correct answer. Uh, Ted Truman from the Peterson Institute. Uh, I think your report is very, let me say first actually on the, IEO's report, which I haven't read in the final version, but I read a draft of it. I don't know whether you acknowledge your commentators. But uh, actually quite useful because it does at a fairly granular level say that there has been, as you say in your report in some aspects, uh, it tells you what has gone on in the fund since uh, in the last 10 years in this area, which is, I think, even for people who study the fund reasonably closely, as I do, is quite not a useful document. Uh, uh, and I think your uh, Geneva report is also useful. In some sense, it is um, too provocative. <laughs> I mean, you provoke with your ideas, right? And uh, they may be, as you say, so provocative. They may not have much influence. We're here at Peterson Institute for International Economics. Uh, might have not uh, uh, produced much response in the in the in the, in the policy circles. Uh, I do want to push you a bit on the on the facility, the swap lines facility. I think you're very, I'm not sure, uh, the swaps quick dispersing aspects. I mean, the basic problem is the fund is never going to have the, never going to be granted enough resources to actually respond. I think that's the major problem. It, but it needs enough resources in some sense to provide a uh, credible policy backstop for other kinds of financing, right, which can take place, uh, almost has to take place through the central banks, either directly through the fund or indirectly relating to the fund, uh, because that's where the money is. Um, uh, I think you're a little unfair on the swap side. You're certainly right about big countries and little countries. But in if you look at the record of what the Federal Reserve did in the crisis with respect to the four emerging market countries, they had basically applied your criteria. Okay? So they said, do these countries have good policies so we can count on being able to pay? We can count on their policies that qualify in that sense. In your, you want to do this through the Article 4s, sort of indirectly, something I proposed for years and never gotten anywhere. Um, so in fact, they applied your criteria, adjusting for the fact that you had to be systemically relevant, and then in order to be repaid, they said, do they have enough reserves so that they'd have to repay us, rather than going to the fund? Uh, so in some sense, they, they applied the two policy backstops, if you want to put policy backstop and the financial backstop. And so the really challenge is to figure out a way to do that on a broader scale. I think you're right. Uh, and, you, and in some sense, you're only going to get with through the central banks, and that needs to run up against the domestic uh, domestic orientation of the central banks. Uh, but uh, as German and I have separately wrote on, written on this, in some sense you need this process to, uh, to produce, to be able to access the central banks, to provide, 
to the countries that are truly well run uh, uh, liquidity and then and the other ones in some sense in terms of the global financial safety net people think of a global financial safety net is just swaps well it's not just swaps right in some sense IMF programs are part of the global financial safety net too both for the countries uh, and for the system uh, so I would push you a little I mean I think you are close to that with your FQF or FQL <laughs> uh, but I wonder whether you uh, just are not completely realistic and well, I'm being unrealistic too, but it's completely realistic in this case. Yeah, I, yeah, FQF, I've, we had a lot of discussion, FQL, FQF, but I did most of QF. But it's a, it's, a, it's a facility. You are right that at the end, the big problem with the fund is the lack of resources to provide in a big crisis or with big needs to provide funding and, and a backstop. It's that, that's that's a, an, an, that's the question. We have some discussion. While you were talking, I said, well, the fund could 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 guarantee the swap lines, for example. That would be uh, the so so you said so the, the central bank provides the the, the liquidity without having a, a, a without having a, a, a risk so this could be so all the problems about about how you justify Congress would be would be second order so we thought about that the problem is that the fund unless that you change the articles of agreement they can cannot borrow or 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 in, in, a, in a simple way borrow or or be guarantee of the of the of the swap of the, of the central bank, this big central bank, you cannot borrow, it's a fund. It's not that you don't have capital to say, well, this is, well, this is my collateral for the guarantee. So that, that's, I think, that's a problem. And, and perhaps, perhaps if one wants to put together this, one should have to think about how the IMF could borrow. But this is, this is beyond the reforms that we propose, but I think that it's a, Good thing we, we discuss a lot, but and, and we always go with the with the stack with the articles of agreement. So, but that uh, I think that the idea how to make swaps and fund work together it can work for for countries. Now this worked very well during the global financial crisis, but now they think that there is a problem with South Africa uh, or, or, or with another or some country that would qualify perfectly for the for with Poland. Okay, but how you can extend the swap line to Poland if it is just a problem in Poland? So it's a, that, that's, I think, that, 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 that's a problem. Where this FQF really could help. And, and yeah, it's a Hi, my name is Miguel de las Casas. I also work at the IEO with, with Charles. I have two, two brief questions. Um, so at the beginning of your presentation, you mentioned that um, the contingent credit lines didn't work. Um, my question would be how, I mean, why do you say that? Um, and I, I ask because I worked quite closely with Mexican authorities for a while. And my sense is that they are quite, they were at least quite happy with the FCL. So uh, that would be my question. My second question is on governance. Um, why do you think that uh, kind of central bank like team, management team at the IEO will be more Isola IMF <laughs> would be more isolated from political interference than a well-balanced, uh, quota-based executive board in which you know national interests can counterbalance each other. Assuming, of course, that um, quotas are fair, uh, the quota formula is well designed and works. And thank you. Okay, uh, regarding the, the precautionary credit line, the, yeah, it's a, the, the precautionary credit line, there are just three countries out of many, many countries. And it was very difficult, and it's very uh, um, idiosyncratic, the reasons. I think that Mexico had the Mexican crisis, they need a lot of money, they are next to the US, which used to be a good neighbor, now it's not necessarily a good neighbor, so, so it's a, it's a but, I, but now, 
Of course, Mexican authorities, Colombian authorities, and Poland authorities at the time, when they had the credit facility that they were paying, they should say that they were quite happy. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure it, it helped. And, and we can talk more about this. And I'll, I'll tell you. And about the political interference, the political interference will always happen. And there is always political interference. The, the question is the decision making. So when the decision making will say, okay, try to leave the political interference outside, I think that makes it, it's more credible in an independent authority. This is, I think, the story of central banks. So, but, but, but you are right, that could be, but it's a, it's, a, it's a story about the workings when you, you are not the exact representative of a major shareholder. So this is, I think, that is, uh, but also is, Yeah, so f first on, on this debate, um, sorry, uh, Jeremy Zettelmeyer, Peterson Institute for International Economics, I apologize, thank you. Uh, so, um, so, so thank you for sticking to your guns on independence and accountability. So when the first Gen Geneva report came out, it was a real inspiration in that respect, particularly to young people like myself working at the IMF. We've had the types of conversations we have today many times in the funds, I, have, I remember having conversations with Stan Fisher exactly along the lines of what you have heard from Charles or from Olivier now, you know, they basically say, look, German, don't you understand? The whole legitimacy on the fund rests on the idea that it is a political institution. If you take away from that, you know, it's gonna be much worse. So I, I think that, you know, one, one can make this argument, it's a legitimate argument, I think, the, um, uh, the what, what, what we have one data point in the meantime that we didn't have uh, at that time, which is the role of the ECB uh, during the Euro area crisis, and it shows that you know having an independent institution in that type of role is doesn't is not a silver bullet, but but neither does it automatically um, undermine the legitimacy. I mean the independence in in these uh, types of situations uh, ultimately. It depends on whether you can make a case that you know, your mandate dictates you uh, to undertake certain courts of action, and that's where the legitimacy comes from. Right? And, and so, you know, of course, the ECB has been, has been uh, broadly attacked on, on many actions that it took during the Euro area crisis, but, but I don't think that it is the independence of the ECB per se that has created a, a legitimacy problem for the uh, ECB at that, uh, at that time. Uh, it's had to juggle uh, politics. Uh, it juggled them in a slightly different way than it would have if it had been more politically independent. On, by and large, I think it, it, was a, it, it was a good thing. So, so on that one, I would just support you. I, I also think the FQC, is that F, you call it? whatever. F, whatever. <laughs> I, think, I think it's actually a neat idea because it, it would provide, I mean, the fund would, of course, say, look, we can do this weekend program with any country, right? We don't need to, in some sense, pre-qualify countries for quick treatment because, in effect, in a, in, a, in a pinch, like we did it in Korea on a weekend in 97, we can do it again. But the whole point is the, the public signal, right? And so that, I think, would be a good idea. Fin the final question is... Um, on this uh, small country uh, issue, so so I, I, I mean I, t I tend to think the that um, a bit like Ted that the the Fed sort of internalizes this idea that with the exorbitant privilege comes a bit of an, a responsibility too, which is to not let dollar dependent financial systems sink. Uh, so this notion that there is a little bit of an, in, uh, an indirect lender of last resort to all banks out there that are dependent on, on dollar funding. And, and so the th thing, and, and I always thought that the constraint for the, to the Fed in, in, in following through on that was really um, um, uh, um, a credit risk, uh, right? Which translates into the two criteria that Ted named. So I was surprised to hear from you that you think that being a small country <laughs> means no one pays attention to you. Did, did you actually ask for an FCL and were you, were you rebuffed at the time just because you were small? Because surely, you know, Chile is the best credit risk in the world. So that would be shocking to me. Okay, yes, uh, one minute. I, I like your point. I, the, the answer, IMF is a political institution, so forget about independence. Central banks are also, and, and you provide a great example. The ECB is an independent, is a, in a quite 
politicized and complicated region. So it's a, a, regarding small countries, I, yeah, I gave a call. I gave a call to a friend that was governor. I said, well, why you didn't include it in the big four? I said, well, <laughs> you are small, and we have a chat, and it was just a part of the things. It was nothing dramatic, but it, so just to have the stamp for the Fed would have been great. But we didn't need it at the end, and, and they were not activated. But, the, but this is a, who cares about jail? So, so uh, I have friends, and they answer the phone within a, 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 a reasonable time. OK, but what about some other small countries? So let's forget that. that. That's the concern with the multilateralism. I think this is not saying swap lines are bad. Swap lines are great. So, but they cannot be the, 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 the instrument for, for the global economy. So we don't need it. Jose, thank you. Thanks thank you. you all.